1807, the Frenchman, Paul Cornu, embarked on the first manned only a few feet above the ground and hovered there for less than a minute. For some years afterward, the idea of vertical takeoff aircraft excited experimenters in Europe. Still, developing the technology for it wasn't easy. The yet only one attempt was made to produce a military helicopter. The Germans built a tethered helicopter for use as an observation platform. But after a few flights, the machine crashed. This time, the war ended with little progress in helicopter engineering and design. However, one important technological obstacle was overcome. Without fixed wings to supply it with lift, a helicopter needs a much more powerful engine than a conventional airplane to get aloft. Following the First World War, these engines were becoming more readily available. Meanwhile, the fascination with vertical takeoff flight grew quickly and led to bizarre, if ingenious, designs. In some cases, Early experimenters made no attempt to design their machines for forward flight, even if they succeeded in getting them off the ground. Every wing enthusiasts struggled throughout the The sky was the limit. A reliable rotary winged aircraft appeared, pioneered by the Spaniard, Juan de la Chierva. His autogyro was actually not a true helicopter, but an important forerunner. It turned the main rotor to provide vertical lift. Once aloft, the engine drove only the propeller, supplying the thrust to pull the aircraft through the air. Chierva built a series of successful autogyros and introduced key refinements to rotor technology, sometimes called a flying windmill was being evaluated for a military observation role. But because its speed, range, and cargo capacity were limited, military planners chose to use small fixed-wing aircraft instead, such as the Fiesler Storch and the Avro Lysander. Gradually, the autogyro fell out of favor. But the work of Chierva and the other experimenters had at last opened the way. First dramatic breakthrough came in Germany during the summer of 1937, shattered all existing records for helicopter performance. The F-A-61 topped the previous altitude record of 500 feet by climbing to 8,000, and its 75 mile an hour speed was nearly three times faster than the competition. But it was Hanna Reich, Germany's first female test pilot, who demonstrated those in Berlin. However, the search in Germany stalled. Air power was vital to the form of conventional aircraft, like fighters, bombers, and transports. These would be sufficient for all their needs. Since Hitler intended only a brief war, he paid little attention to long-term aviation planning. So while researchers tried many intriguing aircraft projects, few went beyond the prototype stage. Vulnerable limbers discovered that small, rugged aircraft operating from timber ways. For example, on the vast eastern front, miles of difficult terrain often separated German soldiers from the nearest supply base or mobile hospital unit. In many, medical personnel could reach them. To help, were used as air ambulances beyond the actual number of lives saved, blown out quickly, boosted their morale. Later, spectacular propaganda coups of the war, the rescue of Hitler's deposed ally, Mussolini, from his confinement atop the 9,000-foot-high Gran Sasso d'Italia. Germany produced only two helicopter models to Draca, was a larger more it could carry six the germans used a draca to make deliveries to their alpine troops in the caucasus and torturous roads heavy allied bombing of industrial planbury mainly for shipboard reconnaissance duties during the war 
Its remarkable design won the respect and esteem of aviation experts everywhere. Meanwhile, in America, the era of the helicopter had arrived. Among its leading figures was the Russian-born Igor Sikorsky, who would be known as one of the most illustrious. Sikorsky had first experimented with rotary wing flight in his native Russia prior to World War I in 1919. Became the successful designer of the famous Clipper flying boat. Then in the 30s, Sikorsky returned to helicopters. The most facing the helicopter designer was that of torque, a reaction where the engine turning the rotor one way also tends to turn the body of the machine in the other direction. Usually, the problem was solved by using two or more rotors, which balanced out the torque. Sikorsky's 1939 prototype, the VS-300, featured a single main rotor with a small anti-torque rotor on the tail. The four, and failed. But with it, Sikorsky set the pattern for many future success helicopters soon knew They still made a strong impression. One of the Sikorskys carried out the first helicopter rescue of a downed air crew from behind enemy lines. When the war ended in 1945, skepticism about the helicopter's military value persisted. Many claimed it was too expensive and noisy to run, as well as too limited in payload, range, and speed. Others saw its battlefield vulnerability as a major weakness. yet to come. In the aftermath of World War II, as the European economy struggled to life, the United States became home to those involved with financing helicopter research and development. Within a short time, a flourishing industry sprang up. The Bell Helicopter Company became one of the most famous in the business. Its post-war model, the Bell 47, was the first commercial helicopter to receive the Civil Aviation Certificate in 1946. The weighted bar, attached below the two-bladed rotor, was a feature developed to help stabilize the machine during flight. Another successful family of helicopters was built by Stanley Hiller's firm and used a unique arrangement of short auxiliary blades as part of the control system. Although designers focused mostly on single rotor helicopters, some preferred to work on tandem rotor models. Foremost in this field was Frank Piasecki, whose PV-3 prototype was called the Flying Banana. Despite its odd appearance, the PV-3 was the first in a long line of outstanding military helicopters. Meanwhile, in Europe and the Soviet Union, development moved more slowly. Several original British designs went into production, but during these hard economic times, most companies built Sikorsky models under license. Yet in June 1950, the conflict that provided the first real test for the helicopter erupted unexpectedly at the 38th parallel in Korea. The hard, rugged terrain of Korea made any movement on the ground difficult. Roads were mostly poor and either muddy in the rainy season or snowbound in winter. With these conditions, the helicopter's speed and mobility quickly emerged. In all, some 600 machines were used during the Korean conflict, and they proved critical, especially in their casualty evacuation role. Korea became the first war where the sound of rotor blades chopping the air meant to wounded or embattled troops that help was on the way. During the fighting, helicopters removed over 25,000 wounded United Nations soldiers from the battlefield, as well as rescuing a thousand airmen who had been shot down. Helicopter pilots in Korea were usually forbidden to fly where enemy fire was likely. Their machines had no protective armor 
and they carried no weapons to defend themselves. Still, their missions to the remote hillsides were often dangerous. The well-publicized success of the helicopter in air ambulance and rescue work tended to overshadow its usefulness in other military tasks. Yet, these were considerable. In reconnaissance and communications duties, the ability to hover and do pinpoint landings gave the helicopter greater versatility than fixed-wing aircraft. And despite previous fears, helicopters showed surprising resilience when coming under enemy fire. With time, the military began conducting a few experiments to arm helicopters in the field, allowing them to strike back. By the early 50s, the helicopter was becoming a formidable tool in the armory of war. In the years following, the armed helicopter was to bring about the most radical change in the rules and tactics of land battle since the appearance of the tank in 1916. Britain and France saw much of their imperial empires crumble. Guerrillas and other independence fighters, sometimes warring with each other, were stirring up trouble in many colonies or former colonies. As the various brush fire wars and revolutionary campaigns erupted, helicopters proved a vital asset. In particular, the British used them successfully in Malaya, Aden, and Borneo. fleet of helicopters during its war in Indochina for evacuating the wounded. However, during the ill-fated defense of Dien Bien Phu, enemy artillery destroyed four ambulance helicopters, and the French soon put a stop to these flights. Back home, the French military committed itself to creating a strong helicopter force which was particularly effective during the bitter war in Algeria. Out of this commitment also grew France's thriving helicopter industry. One of that nation's most successful machines was the Alouette, the first helicopter built by the gas turbine engine. Less than half the weight of a piston engine, the turbine generated eight times the power and proved far more reliable. They also ran more smoothly on inexpensive kerosene rather than costly aviation fuel. The Soviet Union, too, made impressive progress in the development and production of helicopters. But it would be many years before the Soviets deployed them in battle. Throughout the 50s and 60s, however, the United States spearheaded the effort to advance the military helicopter concept. The idea of air mobility grew in popularity and spawned the flamboyant term air cavalry to describe a bold new flying force of the future. I done crashed my whirly bird. I done crashed my whirly bird. And my IP he got killed. And my IP he got killed. Oh my goodness, what a thrill. U.S. military planners proposed forming 12 helicopter battalions even though that number of troop-carrying helicopters did not exist at the time. But with continuing refinements in design and the introduction of the more efficient turbine engine, a new generation of high-performance helicopters was soon to take to the skies. One of the most over 1956, deliveries to the military began two years later. Its original army designation HU-1 was quickly adapted to the universal nickname Huey. Overall, the Huey was built in larger numbers and used by more air forces 
than any other military aircraft since the Second World War. But with development of these new helicopter forces came the need for more pilots, air crews, and maintenance staffs. The military began training and testing pilots who could control an aircraft requiring superior coordination skills. It was a lengthy process with rigorous standards enforced at every level. Compared to fixed wing aircraft, helicopters are both more dangerous and more difficult to fly. While jets normally operate thousands of feet in the air, helicopters function at fairly low altitudes, which means the pilot only has a few seconds to avoid crashing if anything goes wrong, while maneuvering foot-operated rudder pedals. Safe and efficient flying involves making continual and subtle adjustments with these controls. And importantly, because knowing how a helicopter works is essential to flying it. Each rotor blade can swivel by a few degrees as it spins, changing its pitch, the angle at which the blade cuts into the air. A complex mechanical arrangement allows the pilot to vary the pitch of the blades, either individually or collectively. This controls maneuvering and steering. Even a simple vertical takeoff requires knowledge of several principles. To ascend, the pilot first increases the pitch of all the blades while increasing engine power. This in turn increases the engine torque, requiring an adjustment to the tail rotor. But the job doesn't end there. For the first few feet above the ground, the helicopter is partially supported by an air cushion formed by the downdraft of the rotor. If the vertical ascent continues, the downward suction of the rotor thins the air directly above the helicopter, which diminishes the lifting efficiency of the blades. In order to climb as quickly as possible, the pilot must fly the aircraft forward as well as upward. Every helicopter model has different handling characteristics. As a safety feature in case the engine failed, most machines were designed to descend auto-gyro fashion with the rotors freewheeling. For the pilot, performing a simulated emergency landing with the engine switched off was a tense but necessary part of the course. After graduating to first-line combat helicopters, the pilots faced a further period of intensive training, particularly in the techniques of low-level flying. Besides its inherent hazards, this kind of flying adds difficulties to navigation since, at low altitudes, fewer landmarks are visible. During the early 60s, American helicopter forces grew in strength and sophistication. Meanwhile, the conflict which would soon embroil them and which would introduce the armed helicopter was forming in the swamps, paddy fields, and mountains of a small country across the Pacific. Despite American finance and support, in 1954, France had given up trying to hold on to its colonies in Indochina. After the French departed, the United States moved into Vietnam, and within a few years, the continuing conflict was to escalate into a full-scale war. The first U.S. helicopters sent to Vietnam were two transport companies which, protected against the ocean's corrosive spray, 
arrived in late 1961. They were soon followed by other machines, including the first batch of Hueys. Initially, the helicopters took on the same kind of support and rescue work which they had done so successfully in Korea. And in Vietnam, the helicopters continued these functions till the end of the war. But the course of the conflict forced a rapid evolution in helicopter design, as well as in its uses. Soon, the United States was openly committed to warfare on a massive scale. At its peak, the number of American servicemen in Vietnam rose to well over half a million. In addition, U.S. forces received support from contingents of South Korean and Australian troops. Americans brought everything with them, from aircraft carriers to tanks. But to their frustration, the full weight of their firepower was negated by an enemy that usually avoided conventional battles and fought a well-organized guerrilla war. Though small, Vietnam was a country well-suited to this strategy. It was largely made up of mountains, subtropical forest, and extensive flatlands, which would flood periodically. The Americans tried mass bombing tactics, but these were not only ineffective, they were later found to be wasteful as well. As the fighting continued, the American military commanders persisted in believing they could win the war and based much of their strategy on the use of helicopter forces. They thought that by transporting men to face the enemy on the ground, they could achieve ultimate victory. From the start, all four main branches of the American Armed Forces, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, found use for the helicopter. However, there were some disadvantages. Occasionally, low-lying clouds put a stop to helicopter missions, and the humidity caused problems, especially with the wooden rotors of the earlier machines. The thinner air at mountain altitudes also affected their performance. But otherwise, its ability to overfly any kind of terrain and to land virtually anywhere made the helicopter indispensable to fighting a war with an elusive enemy. Nothing else in the U.S. military arsenal served as a more effective battlefield delivery vehicle. Still, the military had to adapt them for their new offensive role, since the older helicopters gave their crews little protection from hostile fire. One precaution involved placing armor around the engine and other vulnerable parts of the helicopter. Speed was another form of protection. The fast troop-carrying Huey helicopter was called the Slick because of its small frontal area and smooth, streamlined appearance. There was another sure method of protection, outfitting the helicopters so they could return fire with fire. At first, Helicopter crewmen simply fired their machine guns from the open doorways. But soon came the factory-equipped helicopters with onboard weapon systems like machine guns, multi-barreled miniguns, shell-firing chain guns, and rocket pods. These weapons were often readily interchangeable. So it was in Vietnam that the helicopter gunship was born. 
and developed into one of the most formidable instruments of war. As more advanced helicopter types came into service, both speed and lifting power increased. The streamlined Huey Cobra was an updated version of the Bell Huey and traveled nearly twice as fast. Its armament was mounted on the undersides of the stub wings, which also provided lift in forward flight. Successive versions of the larger tandem rotor Chinook remained in production for years. These big helicopters could transport many men, but more importantly, they carried vital heavy equipment like jeeps, military bulldozers, and artillery. With the war in Southeast Asia, the concept of an air cavalry became a reality. Many typical operations began with a light reconnaissance helicopter, usually a loach spotting an enemy nearby. Within minutes, this set a major exercise in motion. Hundreds of battle-ready troops climbed into their slicks. Escorting gunships accompanied the transports, holding fire for the landing, since the North Vietnamese were adept at subtle decoy tactics. Often, an artillery battery was set up within range of the trouble spot to provide additional covering fire. The helicopter pilots learned to fly under the arc of the artillery shells. The most hazardous part of any operation was setting the troops down safely in the LZ, or landing zone. Arriving at the zone, the gunships unleashed a furious hail of suppressive fire around the perimeter. Over time, pilots learned to refine their landing skills and increase safety. By hovering a few feet in the air, rather than touching down, a helicopter could speed away directly after the last man disembarked. Helicopters took on many other key tasks and assignments. In particular, they were critical to moving small groups of special forces quickly into remote parts of the jungle. One of the helicopter's most important achievements in Vietnam was the recovery of other helicopters and fixed-wing aircraft, which had been brought down by enemy fire. In all, U.S. helicopters retrieved around 12,000 machines which are either repaired or used for valuable spare parts. Late in the war, as the North Vietnamese stepped up their offensive campaign, the helicopter was adapted for yet another role, that of tank buster. became a proving ground for the versatility of the helicopter. Whether reconnaissance or rescue, troop delivery or tactical assault, these machines earned the respect of the fighting men. But despite the strategies of military planners, Vietnam was not a war which technology or airborne firepower could win. Even with massive attacks on their outposts, the North Vietnamese found ways to avoid capture. Many of their skillfully constructed tunnels and underground shelters 
withstood the heaviest U.S. onslaughts. Eventually, the United States could no longer continue the long and bitter struggle. As the North Vietnamese acquired heavier caliber guns and portable ground-to-air missiles, helicopter losses rose. Winding down, the American forces took refuge in a diminishing number of surrounded encampments, and the helicopters stayed on till the end. U.S. helicopter crews even played a key role during the final evacuation of Saigon on April 29, 1975. On that day, under desperate circumstances, the principal rescue force of Marine, Navy, and Air Force helicopters carried more than 7,000 evacuees to safety aboard American ships stationed in the South China Sea. American withdrawal from Vietnam, Cold War tensions remained high. To counter the NATO forces they saw stationed in Western Europe, the Warsaw Pact nations equipped themselves with a formidable series of Soviet battlefield helicopters, like the Havoc and the Hokum. Meanwhile, both the Americans and the Soviets continued to develop anti-helicopter weapons, particularly missiles. During the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, the West supplied these missiles to the guerrillas, who used them strategically against their well-equipped foe. At sea, where the east-west rivalry was also intense, helicopters added a crucial new dimension. No longer was naval aviation limited to huge and costly aircraft carriers. Helipads were built on the most modest size warships. Fitted with radar, a patrolling helicopter could scan a far wider horizon than the tallest ship. The helicopter was also ideal for anti-submarine work. And, in the era of the nuclear submarine, this was a vital function. By suspending its listening apparatus, a helicopter can detect the sound of a submerged adversary with greater sensitivity than a ship. The helicopter's potential for amphibious assault operations brought about further changes. A completely new type of ship, the helicopter carrier, took to the waves. During this time, the technology continued evolving. From the beginning, helicopter designers had faced challenging aerodynamic problems. One had to do with the fact that when a helicopter flies forward, the advancing rotor blade cuts through the air faster than the retreating rotor blade. In machines from the autogyro to the Huey and beyond, designers addressed this problem by fitting hinges, which allowed the individual rotor blade to flap up and down, as well as slightly forward and back. However, these hinges had to endure enormous stresses even on a small helicopter, the centrifugal force exerted by the rotors is nearly 20,000 pounds. 
The development of tough new compounds, which could absorb higher stresses, simplified basic helicopter design and enhanced its efficiency. Even with the improvements in helicopters, interest in other forms of vertical takeoff flight continued, and eventually these new aircraft appeared. During the latter part of the century, the helicopter has seen use in many conflicts throughout the globe. Specifically, they played a major role in the British recapture of the Falkland Islands in 1982. And that, despite the loss of nearly all the heavy lift Chinooks when the merchant ship Atlantic Conveyor was torpedoed. The Allies deployed a huge force of more than 2,000 helicopters in the Gulf War of 1991. During the fighting, these machines took on nearly every task for which a military helicopter had been designed. The war also witnessed the largest helicopter operation ever mounted when a large forward supply base was established ahead of the advancing armored divisions. Certainly, the helicopter is more than an instrument for waging war. Unlike much of what has been produced to serve military needs, the helicopter's versatility has converted easily to many peacetime uses. Air-sea rescue is just one of the most notable of these uses. And if all other missions are added in, the number of lives saved by helicopters has been significant. helicopter combines a variety of advanced technologies which, as they continue to develop, will result in the design of more sophisticated machines. Even so, helicopter performance will always be subject to some limitations. For example, when the tips of the whirling blades approach the speed of sound, serious problems arise with the compressibility of air. It's unlikely that any helicopter will ever travel significantly faster than 200 miles per hour. After the first successful flight, it was decades before the helicopter became reliable or powerful enough for the uses of war. But during this relatively brief history, it's established itself as one of the indispensable tools of battle. And regardless of the nature of any future military conflicts, it's certain that there will be a major and critical role for the helicopter. <laughs>